context, even as we share together. Amen. Pleasant Sabbath to you, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath to you all. Okay, so we are together. Praise the Lord. I just want to say to the choir who just, just sang, I picked one line, the last line from what you sang. All things come of thee. 
And as you walked down, I said to remind you, all things come of thee, including our youthfulness. That rich youthfulness, I could not, I could not resist saying to my elder there, you know, when I saw you streaming down and I saw you coming up here, I said, I can see the future. Did you hear me, church? I see the future. We give the Lord thanks. Uh, brothers and sisters, since June 20, since June 20 of this year, Dolores and I have become fully Africanized, but even more specifically, Kenyanized. So if those words were never used before, anytime you use them, please remember they are copyrighted. I want to let you know that we have been blessed. We want to thank this church for having given us an opportunity to be a part of your life in every way. We give the Lord thanks. We have been here and we have been privileged to identify with just about nearly all aspect of your life. And I want you to know that Dolores and I, all things being well, <coughs> we are due to leave your shores tomorrow. So this actually is our, not farewell, it's until then. We leave tomorrow for Dubai, where we continue ministry, after which, by the grace of the Lord, we would have finished our six months journey as we head back home. But we want you to know that while you hosted us here, we were privileged to visit other parts, several parts of the country. You're aware that we left here, we went to Kisi, we did two weeks there, and what a blessed experience it was. We followed that with about a week and a half in Homer Bay, and again, the bar kept raising. And then, of course, we came back home. And we connected with everything of home life. Everything. And we have been challenged and blessed and we have been enriched. And then we had the privilege to leave you again and we went to Kericho and we spent two weeks there and I will be sharing with you some highlights from that session. All told, brothers and sisters, we are leaving better than we came. Better by virtue of the experience, the rich relationship we have forged with you again. I want to very sincerely commend our young sister, don't know her name, who did the children's story. Wasn't that very well done? You did such a good job. Yay, praise the Lord. And I want publicly to say to the parents and the church, you have so many treasures here. I charge you, preserve them. God bless you. You did a great job, so well composed and so well put together, so graceful. Brothers and sisters, this is the last hope for them, the church. You didn't hear me. Say the last hope for them is the church. When we see these rich talents, I'm challenging you, the older ones, make sure by the grace of God, you wrap them tight and keep them stayed in. 
Praise the Lord. As I leave you, I want to share with you As I began with you in June, that this year we're observing the 100th anniversary of family ministries in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I take note that come in two weeks' time, following the church's calendar, we will be doing it again. That is to say, as is in your brochure, family ministry will be observed again. At the end of the day, my brothers and sisters, let us remember, this is the family of God. And that's the same spirit with which we should live. We should seek to preserve the original landmarks of the healthy family life. Today I want to share with you, in keeping with the theme of our camp meeting, I want to share with you the treasure hunt of grace. The treasure hunt of grace. But let me just bring you a little update. After camp meeting here, I went to Kissidel and I, and we were privileged to participate fully in that camp meeting. And I'm going to share with you just a few highlights of it. God be praised after I presented the word for the entire series. There were evidence that his grace worked, that there were those who accepted his grace. And so that happened. I wish to bring your attention to that. God be praised. The, the church family grew. Forty-five persons were buried into baptism. And it was a great rejoicing. And we give the Lord thanks. In addition to that, I want you to know there was another feature that took place. After I preached the, the day in the afternoon, I did a presentation on family life. And then at 7 o'clock in the evenings, the church was very innovative in inviting leaders of the community, the county government, the lawyers and the, those persons who were not able to attend the camp meeting at tent, we had a session for them at Sunshine Hotel every evening. So once camp meeting was over at the tent, then we went to the hotel and we had another session there for these leaders and it was come fully attended house was full and so that was another innovative way of spreading the gospel are you with me there and we truly give the lord thanks for that and then we also close the series as we did here in 2014 with the marriage recommitment ceremony and that again was a very high experience as those couples well, actually, the focus was on those couples who were married uh, 25 years and over, and we had a great experience. So I just thought I would share that with you, that you have an idea what life was like there for us in Karicha. It was a really high experience, and it all happened because you hosted us here first. I want the record to be clear. Because every time I moved to one point, I gave due credit to this church because after all, this is where we were anchored and we moved out. So when I move out and present it, I come back to base. How about that? 
And today, God has given me and Dolores the privilege to come back to base for the final uh, series. We, the topics we focused on there in Kericha, in keeping with the theme of Saved by Grace, was this, but now I found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that was the first presentation. It was built on that. I'm just sharing with you a sample of the subjects we covered there. And then we, all, we looked at the two sides of Jesus. You might be intrigued by that, where Jesus is referred to as the Prince of Peace, but at the same time, later on he said, don't think of me as bringing peace, I come to bring a sword. And so what it meant in essence is that the same Jesus who is the Prince of Peace, when we accept him, the likelihood is that the sword of his word will cut so deeply that it will cut sin from our lives and even cut off those fringes in our lives that will hinder us from making it to the kingdom. And so that was one of the next presentation. We looked at the twin born in heaven's throne room. And that twin was grace. Let me show you them. Justice. When we talk about God's justice, we mean his judgment, his righteousness, his equity, and his fair play. But the other side of the Lord is his mercy, which is his compassion, his pity, and his loving kindness. And then there's the second twin, which is law. These came from God's throne room, but at the same time, grace also came. And so what we saw here is a the, 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 the nature of God towards us as children, his grace and his mercy, the law and justice, this gives us a total and comprehensive perspective of our God. And in his name we say glory to him because this combined nature of his is what we are celebrating being his children today. We opened that up very much there. And then the other subject we looked at was victory in Jesus. We looked at heaven's website. And brothers and sisters, it was as a result of these presentations that God pulled those persons to him. And I want to invite you as you remember your brothers and sisters there and here that we keep them in prayer, that we all grow in grace. Amen. I just want to ask you to join me in saying this. As you consolidate your faith, that is to say, if the Bible says it, I respect it. If that is your conviction, would you join me with that? If the Bible says it, I respect it. You want to do that again with me? If the Bible says it, wonderful. And since Jesus promised victory, amen. Let's run it again. Since Jesus promised victory, don't just say it. Feel it. Why I'm in church today? I am in church to receive. True? Yes. I'm not here because I'm a member or I'm a visitor or this is Sabbath. I am here, this is you speaking. I am here to receive. Yes? And you remember, I told you as a therapist, I always practice this. Every time a client sits before me, my goal is that he or she 
should leave better than he or she came in. Amen, church? Therefore, every time you come to church, you ought to leave better than you came in because you came for something. And that which you came for essentially is victory. So let's say it again. Since Jesus promised victory, amen. And finally, we're back to our point now. God's grace is sufficient. Therefore, and that was not your mouth speaking. It was your mind. You processed it in there. And say, yes, yeah. God's grace is sufficient. So let's go on a treasure hunt. The treasure hunt of grace. I've made reference nearly in all my sermons to Christ object lesson. That is Ellen White, under inspiration, wrote the book by the title, Christ Object Lesson. The essence of it is, Jesus used the objects of life to teach the lessons that we need. The parable of the saw, the parable of the lost coin, my fellow preacher, Yes, all these were object lessons. So, what is the object lesson? Treasure hunt. I have no doubt that some of you are familiar with the concept of treasure hunt. Sometimes when we go on camp, outdoors, we would write little notes or special gifts and hide them somewhere around and then at the time, we announced the treasure hunt is on. And all the campers would go scampering around the campsite, looking under the chairs, lifting up a stone, and, and somebody will shout, out, yeah, I found it, I found the treasure. So we want to use that concept, that imagery, that object lesson to wrap up from my perspective, the focus on grace, the treasure hunt. Here comes our anchor text. You know, that's your custom to my presentations. I use what I call anchor text. That's the anchor when, around which the presentation is built. Maybe this is the first time some of you are seeing this text. That's the good thing about the Bible. The text says... Buy the truth and sell it not. I've emphasized sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, make sure you get something else. Thank the Lord. You know, sometimes you go on the internet and you're searching for an item and the way the promotion is packaged, once you search for your item, then you'll see something pop up. Those who search for this also search for this. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Are you there? Yes. Those who search for this always search for this. Do you want to buy this? Add it to your cart. Well, Solomon was under inspiration. And God had him said, okay, listen, buy the truth and sell it not. In addition to, to the truth, get wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Because if you have the truth, and I'm talking to fellow Seventh-day Adventists, 
If you have the truth and you do not have the wisdom of God to use it, it will destroy you. I have seen. Well, let the spirit come through. One of the prophecies says that many bright lights will go out. It's hard to preach like this, but truth has to be told. Many bright lights, meaning intellectual luminaries, and we're talking about of the church. Knowing the truth, but they did not seek wisdom. And beloved, wisdom comes only from God. Without wisdom, the truth can destroy you. Young man, young lady, as you acquiesce for knowledge, as you go back to school, make sure as you get those degrees and those certificates by God's grace, keep your feet on the ground. Figurative expression means stay humble by the grace of God. Hey, I remember this one. Ambition is the gas of life. Ambition is the gas, gas, G-A-S. Ambition is the gas of life. But keep your feet on the brakes of self-control. Who heard me? Say it again. Ambition is the gas of life. Ambition drives you. But keep your feet on the brakes of self-control. Because if that ambition ever get to your head without you fully grounded, it will destroy you. Buying the truth. What does it mean? Do not barter the truth. Barter means to exchange it. So you are a Seventh-day Adventist. You are baptized. You accepted the Lord Jesus. You embraced it. Be aware that even in the church, there will be offerings to barter it away. Simply put, it means to compromise. Buy the truth. Don't sell it again. Hold it. Buy? Yes, we'll come to that. Do not let it go. Many of you seated here can join me in reflecting on persons who bought the truth, embraced the truth, but something happened and they sold it. They compromised their faith. Here's the next text. Matthew 13, 44. I, ref I call it the spiritual treasure hunt for the grace in Christ. You know what the Bible says. You have it there. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like to treasure hid in a field, the which when a man found, he hides. And for the joy thereof, watch this now, he sells all that he have to buy it. I wanted to connect the two texts. Solomon, buy the truth. Don't sell it. How will I get the truth though? Watch me church. How will I get the truth? I have to be prepared 
to sell all that I have. Well, let's go back to the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus for the truth. And said, okay, Lord, what do I do? Lord said, oh, all that you have, go sell it. If you really want the truth. And you know the story. When the young man heard that, he said, really? Are you saying I'm to, watch me now, give up everything? Yes. You see, in the figurative te context of the verse, it means give up, be prepared to surrender any and everything that will prevent you from being a sound, solid follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be prepared to give up the fringes. Be prepared to give up the extras. If you really are thinking about getting to heaven with the Lord, be prepared to sacrifice. Hello? This is a tough, hard saying. But that's exactly what happened when Jesus told the young man. And the young man, being like any one of us, well, apart from the rich where I am concerned, he walked away sorrowful. And watch me now. When the disciples who have been following Jesus so faithfully heard it, he said, hold a minute. Is that true? And then, you know, our impulsive brother, Peter, he couldn't resist it. He just came straight out to Jesus. And he asked what in business term today is what is referred to as the bottom line question. Peter asked the bottom line question. He said, Lord, but we have given up all to follow you. What's in it for us? That's the business language today. What's in it for us? My brother, my sister, you talk to me now as I talk to you. Ask that question. How much are you prepared to give up so as to follow the Lord in your quest, in your search for truth? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and here comes again. What did he do, church? Sold. Remember now, that's the literal use of the word sold. But in the figurative sense, applying it from a spiritual perspective, it means he gave up all. As long as he saw that this would prevent him from accepting the Lord, he was prepared to shed it. Because he saw something better. Let's get real. I remember many years ago, I don't remember what the topic was, but one, when I was presenting a seminar and one person got up and said, counselor, let's get real. And she asked me one of those million dollar questions. And I want to say to you now, church, when we talk in these high languages about following the Lord, Let's get real. To follow the Lord means sacrifice. Hello? How much am I prepared to sacrifice to remain being a true Seventh-day Adventist 
not a Seventh-day Adventist from a denominational name, but one who follows the Lord based on his words as indeed taught by the church. How much am I prepared to follow? Hey, Peter who asks that question, bless the Lord, I didn't have this in the script, but the spirit reminds me. Peter who asked the Lord this question, Lord, what shall we get from following after thee? Hello, may I take you back to pot, uh, uh, the, the judges all, pilots all? When they had Jesus there arraigning him and interrogating him, do you remember where Peter was? Just in case you forget, let me remind you, the Bible said Peter followed Jesus afar off. Meaning, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, but when I get out there, I am not sure if I want everybody to know. So I will follow afar off. Because I'm not prepared to sell everything. Hello there. So yeah, I will sell this. Mean, well, I will go to church on Sabbath. I'm fine. I'll, I'll sell going out and enjoying myself on a Saturday. I can sell that. Uh, well, let's see. What else am I prepared to sell? Okay. I won't drink alcohol. Yeah, I'll, I'll give up that. Mm. Uh, and you could run a list. But, but, Peter, when he saw, wait a minute, you mean he's going to be crucified? No, sir. I, I don't know him. I don't know. Next thing they hold me to. So I'll follow afar off. Watch me now, church. I'll follow afar off, that's Peter, so that, well, I expect him, however, to release himself. And once he releases himself, I'll just run up now and say, hey, Jesus, I'm here. I'm following you. But I will follow him afar off just in case he didn't got, get away. And then I'll just... You see? These... Oh, thank you, Lord. These are written a four times for those of us upon whom the hands of the worlds have come. Applied, it means Peter's story is not merely for us to read and say, oh, Peter followed afar off. Where Peter's name is, I will write Anthony Gordon. How about you? Am I following the Lord afar off? Am I prepared to to raise the bar. Hello. Come on now. Am I prepared to raise the bar of faith by grace? That by grace, the preposition by is significant. It means what is the means That's what the by means. How? How? And you know this text. Not by my strength. I can do all things. Finish it. Through Christ. Who strengthens me? So, the through is synonymous to the by. And the only way we'll do it through Christ is by his grace. Hello? And his grace is infused in our minds 
as we allow the Holy Spirit, my brother, my sister, wherever you are up there down here, is infused in our minds as we open our minds, as you're doing now, to the Holy Spirit to impress truth. There we go. Truth. So don't you sit there and listen to an academic presentation. This is not This is intended to help us when we walk through that door to be better than we came in. If all when we come in here, we get is a nice sermon. He preached nice. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed? Enjoyed? Then if this enjoyment and I'm failing, Even if you heard this sermon last Sabbath, God has given you a chance to come and hear it again because repetition deepens impression. Amen, church? So, let's go deeper now. We talk, oh, did I say deeper? Please note the text. It says, let us hold fast. Every key word I've emphasized because I use the visual and the audio as the Spirit of God helps us. Listen, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. If you're going to buy it, if you're going to get the truth, you have to buy it fully, completely. Without wavering. Am I talking to somebody today, including myself? Are you there? Fully. And may I remind you, anytime you hear I come in with these parenthetical statements, they're not in there. Spirit bid me. May I remind you, the length of time, my senior brother, my senior sister, the length of time that you have been a member of the church does not guarantee that you have fully bought it. Oh Lord. That's not intended to hurt anyone, but that's the truth. Because sometimes, here comes the Bible again, sometimes some of us bought the truth, but we sold back a piece of it. Hello? For he is faithful that promised. Remember this line, I'm going to come back there. Let's talk some more. We're talking about buying the truth and ensure that the teachings of God's word are ingrained in you. Here's a text, Colossians 2, 7. Rooted. And I want to know the graphic. Please, hello. Let the Holy Spirit of God illuminate your mind. Notice the graphic. Rooted. Deep down. Rooted. Established. Old English word for established. That's fine. Rooted and established in the faith. In the faith. Man, when I saw you young men and young people, so you're streaming down here and coming and said, I said, I repeat it. I see the future. But, young man, young lady, except you are rooted. When the winds of time strike, you can be uprooted because you were not deep enough. What does that mean to be deep enough? Meaning to be a full Seventh-day Adventist inside out. Struggling, yes, but you're a Seventh-day Adventist. May I permit, permit me to use this expression? If they cut you, it's Adventist blood that comes out. Hello? I can't say it any clearer. Oh, by the way, yes, thank you, Lord. It was a court 
and he was charged for being a Seventh-day Adventist. Watch me now, work with me, don't you lose this. By the way, this, even if it's allegorical, it is truly prophetic. The time will come when your faith will be tested. Hello there? Are you prepared for it? This is preparation time. So the court, back to the court. He was charged for being a Seventh-day Adventist. And after all the testimonies came, all the witnesses gave, it was time for the trial judge to declare, make his declaration. Listen, please. The question is, when the judge raises his mallet, and he said, Anthony Gordon, you're charged for being a Seventh-day Adventist. I now declare you by virtue of the witnesses, I now declare you, brothers and sisters, they are one of two words left to come. No, three. Either he will finish it with, I therefore find you guilty. Or you're charged for being a Seventh-day Adventist. And based on all the witnesses that come before me, I declare you not guilty. You're acquitted. You may go. Which would be your declaration? Having bought the truth. I want to say this as I wind down. My brothers, my sisters, in the name of God, I'm challenging you. You're to grow beyond the myopic, insular view of the church. My more than 40 years in the church, I have seen where many members old, matured, have a myopic view, an insular view of the church. I want to challenge you. Hello? The church is more than Nairobi Central. Brothers and sisters, the church that sells the truth that Jesus Christ gave, it's beyond East Kenya Conference, of which we are a part. Young man, sister, when we talk about the church, we're talking way beyond the shores of the union and the division and the general conference. If this, when you say, this is my church, if you are limited to talking about this, then you are myopic. Was that too harsh? You're spiritually insular. You need to raise the bar and have a broader, wider perspective of what you mean when you say, I am a member of this church. God's church is, is the body of saints in him through all the ages. That is to say, when he took the children of Israel out of, his, out of Egypt, 
That's the church he began. Are you there? And through the wilderness, we as New Testament Christians, well, you know, that's not a term we use. But when we speak about the church, we tend to refer to the ecclesia, the called out, as referred to in the New Testament. But the truth be told, when we talk about the called out, hello there, watch me now. When the Lord called out Abraham, come on somebody, preach with me. When the Lord called out Abraham, come, let me show you a place, let me take you somewhere else. That was the church. Are you there? And today, you see this little body here with your proud thousands of members? This is just a minuscule, infinitesimal, virtually number of God's church. Raise the bar when you talk about the church and ask the Lord to illuminate your mind to see his total kingdom and God be praised listen to this I put your name there I and Tony Gordon have a place in that kingdom but I will only access it by grace are we still there you see beloved I'm talking to you as I leave you. Don't be tossed about. Young man, I don't know. I have a passion about you, young people, and it's a cliche sometimes being said. Every preacher, oh, we love young people. Truth of the matter is, let me, let me present my credentials. All of my life, since I started working, has been spent with you, young men, young women, all of my life. And that is why when I came here, I do not consider my mission completed until I meet with the young people. Unfortunately, not many of you were able to come that Sunday morning. But let me say something to you. Young man, baptized, Seventh-day Adventist, young man, young lady who loves the truth, Look on the screen. Let me say to you, don't be tossed about. Should I say that, Lord? Don't be tossed about by any from within or without. You, by the truth, lock it in here. By the grace of God, I, this is you speaking, I am going to remain a true Seventh-day Adventist Christian by the grace of God. I will not be tossed. Listen. Bible says, till we all come in, call this word from a church. What's this word again? Let me remind you, church members, that word is in human experience very evasive. Evasive. Look at this church now, Lord. All wrapped, studying the word of God. But, don't you forget this. Every time you go up on the mountaintop, as the disciples did with Jesus, every time you experience like a transfiguration and you see Jesus in his glory, don't you forget that when you leave church, you're going back down into the valleys. And you know what is down there? Temptation. False teaching. Influence. Everything. That is why every Sabbath you come here, it's like a filling station. Who? Who got that? It's like a filling station. So when, to, when next Sabbath, when you get dressed to come here, I won't be here, but I'm reminding you, once you come through, remember, I'm coming into the filling station. And I expect to be filled up again 
with another serving of the grace of Christ so that I can go back out and live again. Unity. The knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, woman, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. My brother, I'm leaving you and I'm claiming the opportunity to talk with you personally now, sister. Don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men, women. And cunning craftiness. I know this is, if it were my language, I wouldn't use it. But it's in the Bible. Whereby lie in wait to deceive. My brother and sister, you can only know the truth when you bite totally. And every time falls would come, every time deception comes, you check it, listen to me now, you check it against the truth that you know. Every time a teaching comes, somebody comes to infuse something into your mind, check it first. Don't be tossed. I told them at Kericha on Sabbath gone, because segments of this I presented, not the whole as you're getting it now. But I told them this, well, must have been story or allegory, I don't know. You must have heard it before too, but it stands repetition. But the woman who was asked, and young men, young ladies, you know so many times I call you, listen to this. But the woman was asked, uh, what do you believe? Oh, she said, I believe what my church believes. Okay, good. So, so what does your church believe? Uh, oh, my church believes what I believe. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Okay. So, so, what do you and your church believe? My church and I believe the same thing. I caption that a conundrum of faith. Conundrum? Mixed up. Has no real basis. Why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Because my parents are. Really? Because it's the Sabbath. No, all those are plausible reasons because I would be saddened. No. Um, I have to be careful how I say this because I'm sensitive to the fact that there might be parents here whose children might have came up in the faith, have not embraced it fully. But let me, since I'm about to say that, the Spirit says, remind them of this. Somewhere, Ellen White made this statement or is credited to have made this statement. That is to say, for you parents whose children might have left the fold, she said, the last mediatorial work of Jesus, before he takes off his priestly garment, is to send out a mighty angel in response to parents whose children have left the fold and thousands will return before it is too late. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for giving me that message. So now I'll go back to the point I was going to drive home. I said, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Oh, because my parents are. 
because it's the Sabbath, because the church teaches it. And I was about to say, truth be told, those are beginning anchor points. Those are beginning anchor points. Yes, of course, I would be very sad. This is one I was going to make. If my two children were, had not embraced the faith, so I can empathize if you are there, my brother and sister. That's why the Lord bid me give you assurance before I finish what I'm about to say. I would be saddened if they didn't. But remember this. Salvation is not hereditary. You have got to buy the truth for yourself. Young lady, are you hearing me? You've got to embrace it. That's why you go to Sabbath school. That's why you have your lesson study. That's why you sing in the choir. That's why you do what you do at church. Every activity that you perform in the church is an evidence that you're buying the truth. Hello? You're staying on board. Watch out for those inside or outside if they speak not according to this word there's no truth ah, there is no there is no truth and now may I remind you whereas we were talking about truth in the context of a body of truth listen to what I'm going to say whereas we're talking about truth in the context of a body of knowledge and all of this here it is now Jesus is truth you missed that I dropped out the they. The they is human article and it's limited. So drop the they. Jesus is not just the truth. He, help me preach, he is truth. Hello? That's the epitome of your faith. Jesus is truth. So when he spoke to Solomon and bid us buy the truth, he meant buy me Jesus totally and completely. So my brothers and sisters, let me rush it out. Watch this now. Here's the next text. Search the scriptures. See it there? And when you do it for your Sabbath school lessons to fill in the blanks, do it how? Come on, talk to me. How must you do it? Diligently. Not academically. Part of our growth is our academic ability, our intellectual, our intelligence, but it must first be baptized. Come on, say amen. So, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. And so, brothers and sisters, as I wind out now, let me bring your attention to this. The ultimate treasure hunt. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are without sin. Hello, I wanted to look at this. I wanted to leave with this. Can you read it? I heard you. Let me read it again. God's biddings. Good, you got it. God's biddings are his enabling. What's that mean? Lord, I 
heard what he preached today and the explanation of buying the truth meaning I have to give up everything that well I would enjoy but it's not in harmony with what you want from me will I be able to do that by the way I might be talking to somebody who's not yet baptized and one of the reasons you might not be is I don't want to get baptized and then I fall back I don't want to no so when I'm ready I will do it when I feel I'm really ready I will do it but I don't want to go and I might just not able to keep it up ah. God's biddings are his enabling what does that mean he says you heard the truth buy it as to how you will keep it that's not your problem if I tell you this is God speaking if I tell you buy it I guarantee you you can keep it if I bid you come I guarantee you you can stay hello there because ah, my grace is sufficient there are thousands times ten thousands who have bought the truth and have held it close and by the grace of God will not let it go are you there is there anyone here in this large congregation up there here who can say oh yeah I bought the truth I remember when I bought the truth and by the grace of God I'm still holding it meaning I still remain faithful to the church to the teaching of the Bible I bought the truth and I'm holding it firmly Take a challenge now if you are there that is to say yeah I bought the truth and I'm glad when I bought it April 16 1972 was when I bought and I'm still holding it do I look like I'm holding it well I am I ask you a question if you're there having bought the truth and are holding it firmly I would want to challenge you stand to your feet stand to your feet if you bought the truth if you're a baptized member of the church you're there and regardless of the struggles I'm there I am NOT giving up Just pop out of your seat now and stand up that's a testimony whenever I make calls like these I qualify it because calls tend to be generalized and as one who presents the word I do not believe in generalization so my brother I'm challenging you again you're standing sister you're standing is saying yeah praise the Lord I bought the truth and I'm still holding it let me push the button further now raise your hand if standing you're standing and you mean exactly what I just said I bought the truth and I'm holding it Wow thank you Lord is there someone thank you is there someone who out of deep conscience with the Spirit of God pulling at your heartstring you could not stand you could not raise your hand but you would to God you could and you want to if you're there I'm inviting you to pray with me let me pray with you what I'm saying is if you have not accepted the Lord I don't know who I'm speaking to in the last large congregation if you know within your heart 
The truth that he spoke about today, I'm not holding it firm enough. Number one, I might not have been baptized yet. I've not accepted the Lord. I'm coming to church, but I've not really bought the truth. I've not surrendered all to Jesus. And I, this is you speaking, I would like to be prayed for. Hello, let me personalize this. This is my last opportunity with you for now. And I would like to personally pray for such a person. I don't know if you're here. So let me repeat it clearly before we begin to sing my closing song. My call is, if you are not yet baptized, if you have not yet thrown it all in and say, Fully the truth. But you want to do that. Then, while we sing this closing song, permit me to announce it, please. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. We know the song, 109, but it's on screen. While we sing it, I'd like to pray for any such person. Let me open the door a little more. Maybe you're struggling. Right, sure. Maybe you know deep within you, man, what I heard you said today, I would love to be fully on board. If you're there, when we sing it, so which, whichever of the two categories you come in, for strengthening, to be baptized, or just to be prayed for, as we sing, Respond to the impressions of the Spirit and move out. Let's have the prayer. Give me the chance to pray with you before I leave. Marvelous grace. Grace over loving Lord. I'm ready to pray. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Comes your own Calvary's mount at fall. I see you slowly coming. There where the blood of the Lamb was. This is not a show, it's your testimony. Is there someone else who want to join us? Of the two groups, needs strengthening. 